The Golden Hour Birth Podcast, a podcast about real birth stories and creating connections through our shared experiences. Childbirth isn't just about the child. It's about the person who gave birth, their lives, their wisdom, and their empowerment. We're Liz and Natalie, the Golden Hour Birth Podcast, and we're here to laugh with you, cry with you, and hold space for you. Welcome to the Golden Hour Birth Podcast. I am your co-host, Liz. And I'm your co-host, Natalie. And tonight we have Maya from the Bay Area on. Thanks so much for joining us, Maya. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk to you both. Yeah. Um, So if you want to go ahead and tell us a little bit about your family and we can go from there. Yeah. So I'm a mom of two, two girls. Definitely identify as a girl mom. I think... um, I come from a family of where we were three sisters. I'm the oldest of three sisters and my sisters are everything to me. And I can remember being so young and knowing that I wanted to have two girls. No. And it's just, you know, my dream came true in that way. And nothing, you know, against boys. I know we need boy <laughs> boy babies in the world too and grown men in the world too. But I just always knew that I wanted to be a girl mom because that's the family that I grew up in. And that's just what I wanted to to have for myself. So um, even my dog is a girl. So I guess I could add that I'm a mom to a, a girl pup. <laughs> um, and and yeah, my daughters are five and two and a half now. Um, they're the same age gap that my two youngest sisters are uh, between each other. Um, I I didn't necessarily plan like their age gap. Um, it's a little tough. And I think for anybody who has two kids, and I've heard so many people say moms and dads, it's not like twice the work. It's like a million times the work when you add that second kid in there. And I definitely experienced that and and went through that. And, you know, maybe coming out of it a little bit now, like now that she, the youngest is two and a half, they are at an age where they can play together sometimes. Uh, other times they are absolutely fighting over the same toy or, you know, mom or dad's attention, you know, whatever it might be. They might be or physically pulling each other's hair or or (laughs) pushing each other. It's just like, oh my gosh, you guys stop. But (laughs) but it's like I I'd say maybe it's about 50-50. There's those moments where where they play nicely together too. And even just today, um uh usually I do school drop offs in the morning. And dad does pickups in the afternoon. And so when he picked up the little one first, brought her home to me, I gave her a quick bath and then he went to go pick up because they're at two different schools. So he went to go pick up um, big sister. And when big sister came home, they just like hugged and embraced each other. And it's like those moments just warm your heart and like, you know, like tell you you're doing something right, (laughs) that they love each other so much. And um I, I mentioned earlier how my sisters were everything to me. I I knew that I wanted my, I guess, you know, my oldest daughter, because she was an only child at the time, I wanted her to have that sibling bond too, that um, somebody, you know, a best friend always in her corner kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah. You're giving me hope. <laughs> Mine are two and four right now, and they just fight <laughs> all the time. Yeah. <laughs> it's tough that that age yeah it's tough mm-hmm. I don't know and I'm just sweating over here because I'll get there <laughs> essentially <laughs> yeah. how, how old are your kids uh, my son will be two at the end of this month and then my daughter is ten and a half weeks oh wow yeah oh, still so young congratulations so young thank you <laughs> Um, so if you want to go ahead and tell us a little bit about like when you and your husband decided to start a family and then what your pregnancy with your first was like. Yeah. So, oh gosh, so crazy. So I knew, you know, I told you being a little girl, like I knew I wanted to have two daughters. So Mm -hmm. from the moment I was a child, I knew I wanted to be a mom from the, like, it was around my 26th birthday that there was something inside of me that switched and I was like, okay, I'm ready. Like. I'm ready to be a mom now. And I didn't become a mom until I was 33. <laughs> but at 26, I was like, I'm ready. Uh, mind you, at 26, I didn't even have like a significant relationship in life. But I was just like, I'm I'm ready. 
<laughs> so then um it's funny with my husband i it it just so happened that you know when it's like everyone around you in your friend circle starts having the kid and it's mm-hmm. like kind of a trend like everybody's doing it and so that yeah. started happening in our friend group but we weren't there yet and and a lot of um our friend group I, how do I say this nicely? Like they weren't planned babies. Um, so, so I think my husband, and he's so funny, he really wanted us to have a planned family and he really wanted us to be married first. And when all of our friends started having kids, we weren't even engaged. And so I would say I probably started putting the pressure of like, okay, well, if you want to do it the quote unquote right way, then we need to hurry up and get married because I'm ready to be a mom. <laughs> So, you know, we get married eventually. And um, I, you know, again, I wanted to start having babies right away. And Mother Nature, the universe, like whoever, like that, that wasn't in the plan. So I started having um, all these issues in trying to conceive. And I, I'll never know what necessarily was wrong. I would go to the doctor and they would test all the things they needed to test and say everything was fine. Um, But I wasn't getting a period, a regular period. And it's like, well, this just feels like step one. How am I even supposed to try to conceive if I don't know when to try? And, you know, this was supposed to be my, my marker. And so I probably went a year or more with like this desire, this longing of wanting this so bad, wanting to be a mom and not even really having the opportunity to to try to make that happen for myself. And it was so frustrating. Um, and then all along in our, not even just in our friend group, but in like, you know, there's your friend group and then there's like the acquaintances and outside world. And it's just like, seems like everybody and their mom was having babies. And, you know, all of the people who were not trying to have babies were having babies and it was one of those things that just felt really painful for me at the time um and you know I think they tell you to like once you stop trying then it happens you know you hear that all of the time Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I remember we planned this vacation it was summertime we um so we're in California We flew to, where did we fly to? We flew to Utah. We stayed in Salt Lake um, with some family for a couple days. We rented a car. We drove uh, to to Moab. We we, we did all like the hikes and the the beautiful, you know, the nature out there. And then we kept on driving and we drove to to Denver and we did, um, you know, we went to a baseball game out there. We did a lot of like brunch and just a lot of just exploring of this cool city that we'd never been to. And, you know, then from Denver flew back home. I don't know for sure if I got pregnant on that trip, but it was like either on the trip or immediately after, like a month later, all of a sudden I was pregnant. And it was just like... (laughs) so emotional for me um the other funny thing that happened was uh my my roommate in grad school so I I went to grad school in New York um she might have still been living in New York at the time but she was going to be getting married and she planned to have her wedding in Colombia and I was like that sounds awesome I would love to travel to Colombia I've never been there before let me buy a plane ticket and it's like as soon as I bought that plane ticket I found and her wedding date well then I found out I was pregnant and then when I see my due date her wedding date was like a week after and I was like oh Oh, crap I guess I'm not going to your wedding (laughs) and you know did not make it to that wedding and too bad, but but I did have a daughter at, at the time that <laughs> yeah. she got married. So, you know, trade-offs, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so so that was kind of, I guess, leading up to my pregnancy. You know, once I found out I was pregnant, I was actually nervous. I I felt like I had to keep this secret just for myself until I was sure that everything was going to be okay. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, you hear all these stories from others of losing their baby, you know, the pregnancy ending very early. And I just felt like I needed to get over 
um, that first trimester until I could actually celebrate this. Like I was just like anxious because it, it was so hard to even get there. Um, and then once I did make it, you know, past like 13 weeks or so, then I was just like celebrating, telling the world, like, I'm going to have a baby. I'm going to be a mom. And with my first baby, I, I wanted to keep, um, the gender of surprise. Uh, and so many people were so convinced I was going to have a boy. Everyone was convinced. I was convinced I was going to have a boy, even though I had mentioned secretly, I always wanted to have two daughters. And I was just like, just because I want a daughter so bad, I'm going to get a boy. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, I did not find out until the day she was born. Um, my pregnancy was pretty, pretty low key, you know, like I kept working. Um, I, you know, I probably started experiencing, experiencing some back pain, which I felt was normal and maybe later on in life like now have realized like oh maybe that the back pain as early as I had it is not normal and the fact that I still have it maybe that's not so normal um but I was again I was just so happy that it's like of course I went through the first trimester morning sickness and it's it's one of those things that I think you you end up forgetting about <laughs> because mm -hmm. I know it was horrible when I was in it um and and now, you know, it's just like whatever it happened. But, um, you know, I probably like I didn't want to wash dishes and I couldn't look at like the raw chicken without wanting to throw up. But, you know, I think it's just all like that normal first trimester stuff. You get over that. You're in your like glow phase of the second trimester. Your hair and your nails get so beautiful. Your skin, you know, like it was, it was great. But um, <laughs> at around 33 weeks, or yeah, at around 33 weeks, I woke up. It was a Saturday morning. I had just started taking a hypnobirthing class. And so we would meet um, every Saturday morning and go through like the meditation and the breathing technique. Um, I think it was either like a four or five week class. And it was maybe like the third week of it or so. So maybe like halfway through. And um, I woke up and... I just had so much blood in my underwear and it was so scary and, you know, called, called a doctor. They had me come in. I had to miss the hypnobirthing class for that day. And uh, they, it was 33 weeks. They said, yeah, you're having contractions. You're going into labor. And I was like, whoa. Um, so they were able to, I stayed overnight. It was the weekend of the Super Bowl. Um, and my baby was due March 24th, I think, around there was her due date. And so this was like February, like, third, fourth, right in there, second, third, fourth. And um, stayed overnight. They they gave me some sort of medicine that was able to stop the contractions and stop the labor. And they sent me home and they said, you know, we hope to see you here, you know, closer to the end of March. So... um left the hospital uh my my you know I hadn't even had a baby shower yet my my sisters I think were planning my baby shower and uh I had the baby shower over uh what's that holiday weekend in February President's Day weekend mm -hmm. um it was on a Saturday so like don't remember the exact date but let's just say somewhere around the 17th or so on that Saturday and um a good friend of mine from LA came up for my baby shower and was staying with me for the the long holiday weekend. I think she was uh, flying home on Tuesday. And as you know, the baby shower is over. We come back to my house with all this extra food, and we're just enjoying the weekend, just kind of lounging and watching movies. And um, I, I'm having contractions again. Like the night of the baby shower, I remember telling my husband in bed, like. I'm, think I'm having contractions again. Um, I think everybody around me that I was telling them, they were like, they're probably just those Braxton Hicks. And I think I was hoping that, yeah, you're right. But then there was that voice inside of me that was just like, I think I'm having contractions. And so, you know, from Saturday, fast forward to like Monday, which was that holiday, like by dinner time. I remember calling my husband at work and I was like, you have to come home. Like, you just have to come home right now. 
and I'm calling my mom and I'm calling my sisters. Like I just needed somebody there because I was so panicked that I was having contractions. So at this point, I'm 35 weeks and um, I was I was calling for help. You know, my friend is here with me um, and she's trying, you know, she's being as supportive as she can be. But at the same time, I was just like, I need like one of my people, people, you know what I mean? And, um, and so they all kind of got there at the same time. And I remember getting in the bathtub because I don't know who suggested it, but it was just like, I needed to calm myself down. Um, and then I think later on, somebody told me like, no, you shouldn't have gotten in the bathtub. Like that's going to like make the contractions progress even more, (laughs) but it's like, whatever it's done now. Um, but, you know, I had an app of some sort that I had been tracking, like, my whole pregnancy, like, your baby is the size of a, you know, p- pumpkin. Um, and and the app had that contraction timer feature as well and started, like, starting to see, like, how close they were coming and how long they were lasting. And it was like, okay, yeah, now I need to call the doctor again at this point. And so ended up going back to the doctor so mind you, I had been going through this hypnobirthing class where my quote unquote plan was to have an unmedicated birth. And so we we went and this was before COVID. I had, you know, my husband, I think my mom and one of my sisters in the room with me. And, and they were, you know, the people in charge of telling the nurses, like, this is part of her birth plan and this is what she wants. I was in so much pain. I was probably not really in the state of being able to put those hypnobirthing techniques into practice. Um, I've learned a lot more about myself since. And I probably at that stage of my life could not have had a successful hypnobirthing experience. Um, But I I thought I could, but I, I wasn't. I was always the type of person that wanted to control everything. And I think in hypnobirthing, it's very much about relaxing into your body and letting, Mm -hmm. you know, nature take over. Um, But I, I thought I could and I know. So I was very much resisting and doing all the things you're not supposed to do. Um, And probably increasing my, my pain and, and increasing, you know, just the, the difficulty of the experience. So about 12 hours into labor, um, they I start seeing, you know, the concerned faces and just people getting really worried. Apparently I had a fever. And so they were like, a fever typically means infection. Like we, we got to see what's going on. And, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a blur, but what I do remember is just that that change of the the energy in the room of like where it's just like the medical professionals are either letting mom do her thing or they're like talking in like these panic tones and moving around a little quicker than usual. And so it's like I started kind of picking that up. And when a doctor finally came and spoke to me, and I think maybe they were talking first to like the people I had assigned to like take that news. Um, until finally they all decided it was at a level where they needed to talk to me. And so, um, yeah, I, I think um, I had felt some liquid between my legs and I had assumed that my water broke. Um, but they told me later on that it was a lot of blood. And they said that I had an infection and that they were worried about the infection being passed on to the baby and that they wanted to do a C-section. and. And, you know, the, the the safety of the baby. And so I will say that from the hypnobirthing classes, what what was the benefit at that point is like I was able to stay calm at hearing, you know, these alarmed tones and these emergency type situations and make a decision from a calm place. And so they did say like, like, I think it was at a point maybe around noon where they were like, we we could try one more thing before maybe going to an emergency C section. Like let's just try to give you the medication and see if that brings down the fever, see how you you react to it. And so even though I was on this like no medication track, I was at a place where it's like, okay, yeah, let's try let's try your plan B. 
before going all the way to to a C-section. And um, they gave me an epidural. I'm so deathly afraid of needles, but the hypnobirthing techniques help with that too, where I was able to just stay still and breathe through it. And um, they, I, I took a nap. I remember finally, whatever medicine they gave me, I was finally able to just rest and take a nap. And, you know, after being in labor for 12 hours, that's what I needed. And when I kind of came to again, they were still worried. There was still like the emergency kind of tones and energy. And um, they were really wanting to do the emergency C-section. And I was like, okay, like, okay, I'm in a space that I can hear that and that that's what's going to be best for the baby. So let's do it. So we did it. So I have a question. Oh, yeah, sure. All right. Didn't mean to cut you off there. Did they ever find the reasoning for the bleeding between Super Bowl weekend and then when you were in the hospital? I mean, I, I think it was just I. Well, no, they never told me necessarily why I was bleeding because you wouldn't necessarily bleed when you're going into labor. But but I that I mean, I was going into labor at that Super Bowl weekend, and then yeah, yeah, I was supposed to make it all the way till at least I thought closer to forty weeks, but only made it two more weeks before I came back. Interesting. Yeah. I'm just wondering, like, I'm curious why the bleeding started. Yeah. And then they never said anything about it. Yeah. No, I, there's so many things that I, I don't know. And maybe I wasn't in a state of like really wanting to know because mm-hmm. the whole experience is really traumatizing. Um, so, yeah, I go into the C-section never having been through any type of birth before. I don't really know what to expect. And um, the anesthesiologist is there and kind of telling me like, yeah, you can expect this and this and this and that. And um, the, the person that was there with me, he was great. Um, you know, they take out my baby and they put her on my chest and I, you know, I have a picture of that and I'm crying and I'm happy and it's a girl and all of that. Um, when I go into recovery, I... Well, again, I don't know how I'm supposed to feel. I feel a little weird, but I don't necessarily expect to feel fine because I just had a C-section. Um, but then when a doctor comes and talks to me, she tells me that I'm very, very sick. She tells me that um, uh, I don't even remember necessarily, but pretty much the the infection that I had, um, I think I had a couple of different things. So I remember hearing Oreo. They call it choreo for short. I don't know if you all know what the longer version is. Um, and and sepsis. So sepsis is when you have like an infection in your blood and it could like yeah. spread everywhere. And so they were like really puzzled. Like I can tell again, like from like they didn't necessarily know what to do, but they were so worried about me. And I, you know, I was a new mom at this point. So I was like, let me try to breastfeed my baby. Like, how is my baby doing? Like, I just want to hug and love on my baby. But they were so worried about me. So they end up sending me to ICU. And and I'm separated from my baby on the first night of her life. Mm. And that was really hard on me. And and then I'm like looking at my husband like, well, do you stay with her? Or do you come with me? Like, what what what's going to happen to her? Like, what, what's going on? And I'm like, well, I need somebody too. I feel like I need a lifeline. And they ended up assigning a nurse to my daughter to stay with her overnight and and the, and in the ICU it's not like in the the mom and baby unit that they have like that little fold out chair that turns into a bed so that you have your partner like there with you like there is no space for there to be like another person sleeping in the room um but but he was there like I was like you you can't leave me right now and I legit thought I was gonna die like I was just like I have no idea what's going on with me right now um and so I remember, you know, even being in the ICU and the lactation specialist comes in and is teaching me how to use the breast pump and, you know, doing all the things. And I'm just like in this like foggy state of mind where I can't even process anything she's saying. Like even mm-hmm. week afterwards, I would ask my husband like, Am I using the breast pump right? Am I like, what did she say that day? Like, I just wasn't in the space to be able to like process anything. And I think even as she was talking to me, I was like, hold on a minute. And I like turned my head around and threw up because I just, I wasn't well. 
Uh And so I, you know, at some point I must have slept. I don't necessarily remember sleeping, but, um, you know, and they were probably pumping me up with drugs of all sorts. And um, the next day in the morning, they, they said I was a lot better and that I would be able to get out of the ICU that day. Um, at the same time, something about my husband is he's one of those people that like will make friends with anybody, anywhere, anytime. And, and, and you know, has a little bit of a like a charming personality. And so um, they didn't want my baby. Well, yeah, my baby wasn't supposed to be in the ICU because she was a uh, preemie baby and super delicate. And so it was be risky for her to be there where there's so many sick people of of all sorts right but somehow he convinced the nurse to like let them bring me my baby and so she came for like I don't know a few minutes an hour I don't know and and then they had to take her back and it was the best because it was like yeah I'm a new mom and I should be like with my baby but instead I'm here um and then people came to visit and they they visited me and and while the baby was there so then they got to meet the baby and so that was all great they take the baby away and then it was like okay like they come and check on on me and let me know like as long as we see you know xyz then you'll be able to to leave the icu and so things are looking good and um my husband left for a a little while to go take my daughter back to whatever side of the hospital she was going to be at. And when he came back, he had like this different, you know, look on his face and it's like, oh, like now what happened? Like now it's going on. And um, so I was getting I, getting out of ICU and my daughter was then being admitted to NICU. So she had had this episode where she had stopped breathing and as being born at 35 weeks, it's not that uncommon that that would happen. Um, but it was just like, you know, one thing after another. Yeah. And it's like, when when am I going to see my baby? So, you know, I finally get transferred to this other side of the hospital, but she's now not in the room with me still. Like she's in the, you know, neonatal intensive care unit where I have to go and see her. And um, at this point, I know that with C-sections, they, they get you up. They try to get you up and walking pretty soon, but because of the other stuff that I went to through on top of that, um, I, I don't think I had even, you know, been out of my bed yet. And um, I guess just to fast forward the story a little bit, I, I ended up being in recovery for a total of four days. Um, and then in those four days, you know, the Nikki was down the hall, so I'd go back and forth, back and forth. But by the end of the fourth day, they're like, okay, now you're well enough to go home. But my baby wasn't. And so mm-hmm. I had to go home without baby. And, um, you know, I, I know it's it's one of those things that, that people experience that I don't think is talked about very often. Um, because it just felt so, so sad for me. You know, like here yeah. was this baby that I wanted more than anything in the world. And when she finally came to me, there were all these challenges and hoops and just things and uncertainties and you know she was so tiny um well even though she was a preemie she was at least five pounds so I was glad that she was at least five pounds um and it was it felt like it was the longest 10 days ever but she she was in the NICU for a total of 10 days so um you know it's one of those things where in retrospect like when you're look when you're not in it, ten days doesn't feel like a lot. And when you're yeah. in it and you don't know when it's gonna end, it's just like like what what is life? Like I would come, you know, I'd come home and to an empty well, an an empty house, but a house full of baby stuff because we had just come off of that baby shower weekend. Mm-hmm. And um then I would wake up every three hours or so in the middle of the night to pump because you have to mimic the baby's eating schedule and then try to bring breast milk to the NICU so that they're exposing the baby to your breast milk. Um, and then working on breastfeeding in the NICU, which I think was the benefit because then I had like the support of nurses there with me. Um, you know, just this really different path to motherhood than I expected, you know. Again, this was pre-COVID, so it's like I 
back then I was like, there was none of that like celebration of people coming to visit you in the hospital room with the balloons. And I know because of COVID that also doesn't happen so much anymore. Um, but, but yeah, it was just like a very hard, hard time. And the postpartum was rough on me too, because I just went into this really like depressive, like, why did this happen? And, you know, just kind of this fear too of like, is my daughter going to be okay? So I'll say, you know, she's five now. She, she has asthma, which may or may not be connected to, to that. You know, they say that the lungs is like the last thing to develop in utero yeah. and, and she missed out on those last five weeks inside. But, um, but my, her dad also has asthma. So he could, she could have just still had it anyways. Um, mm-hmm. and the fact that she's, she's healthy and she's, you know, She's not tiny. Like I, I remember growing up, one of my cousins was premature and she was all, always shorter and just smaller than her peers, uh, than the rest of us. And I thought maybe my baby was always going to be small, but she's not. She, she's pretty tall and, you know, she's, she's pretty healthy. So she's, um, she's pretty amazing, actually. And it, she just had a little bit of a rough start to life and. And, um, you know, I'll never necessarily know why we went through that, but, but we did. And it was, it was rough. Um, but, but yeah, we're, here we are now. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Seems like there was a lot of lack of communication too, just from like through the whole hospital stay, it seemed like you didn't really know what was going on and nobody was talking to you. Yeah. It could also be that. I wasn't in a state to like hear it and process it and, and perhaps yeah. I've blocked it out. And it could also just be a little bit of a blur because it was five, more than five years ago now. So, um, but, you know, I think all of those things could be at play. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And birth trauma, you know, affects your memory and, you know, you can like block things out or... Mm-hmm. What not? I'm yeah. Trauma just does a number on our brains. Yeah, yeah. I would say that that is probably one of the most traumatic things I've experienced. Um, you know, I think maybe there there's so many different types of trauma, right? Um, but I think where where it comes to, you know, I was in the place of of even wondering, like, am I going to survive this? I, I don't know that there's anything else that I've been through quite like that. Yeah. Yeah. Really well, scary. hearing the word sepsis is it's huge. I mean, I think of life or death situation in that play. So mm-hmm. completely, completely right. Um, so um, if you want to go into your second birth or, you know, anything yeah. that she deciphered. When you're going to try again? Yeah. Well, so the first thing I'll say is that going through that experience, I was like, that's it. I'm never going to have another kid again. It's way too risky. Like, just no, no, thank you. Just one is fine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it probably took just about like six months or so where I was, you know, my daughter was so cute. And, you know, she was actually probably up until, I don't know, like, she went, she started her like terrible twos pretty early, <laughs> but before like hitting that stage at let's say around 20 months or so, she was actually such an easygoing kid. Like, I just kind of felt like you're like, this is so easy. She's got her routines down. She knows what to expect. She, because she knows what to expect and can anticipate it, she can help me out and she'll go get her own shoes or her own, sweater, you know, little things like that. And I'm like, yeah. if this is what parenting is, I can do this all day, every day. Like, let me throw another one in the mix. Like, <laughs> uh, you know, big mistake. But um, so, so that at first I didn't want to ever have another kid. Then I was like, I could do this again. And um, I didn't want to have another kid right away. Like I wanted to space them out a little bit. But um, yeah, I'd say around the six month mark is when not not to say that I was healing from the trauma, but that the the traumatic memory started to fade. Mm-hmm. And I started to be open to the idea of having another one. And um, 
so it was a complete 180 experience. Every, almost everything was the complete opposite. With my second daughter, um, I had, I had an IUD placed um, shortly after my first daughter was born. So it was in November of 2019 that I was like, I, I think I want to start trying and I'm going to go to the doctor and have this IUD removed. And um, so my husband and I talked and I was like, where we don't have to try, try, but we don't have to like not try kind of thing. And so that was just kind of my approach. Like it happens when it happens. And um, so that was November. And then probably in December is when I started getting like a another period cycle again. So, you know, if I wanted to try to track, I could, but we had said we weren't going to be necessarily trying, trying. Um, and in January, I found out I was pregnant. So it was like essentially on the first try. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. And and again, into the try, but not try. So, so it was just like, it, here it is. There, there's your new baby. And I did everything the exact opposite. Um, I told people I was pregnant like right away. <laughs> I was just like, I, I'm pregnant again. Like, you know, this was January 2020. Um, as we know, the world was about to change drastically. So, so many people knew before the shutdown that, that I was pregnant and, and some people didn't because, um, it was still really early. And so when COVID hit, I, I would say this is just the biggest difference is that my pregnancy was marked by anxiety because I, I was just so anxious about COVID one and then being pregnant during COVID. I just felt like I was this high risk category of this disease that nobody knew anything about really yet. Yeah. And I was just one of those uber cautious people, like really hunkered down in my bubble, you know, didn't want anybody around me ever and, and just feared the worst, you know, if my husband so much as coughed, like, it was like, no. Um, but so so it was that. And then the other thing that's polar opposite is that um, when you've had a premature birth, your likelihood of having another one increases. And so I was getting nervous around the 33 week time period. And something did happen around 32 or 33 weeks where I had this um, discharge, just kind of like thicker discharge. And I remember calling and I think they had me come in about it. And I remember mentioning it to my supervisor where, where I was working at the time because I just felt like she was a, a newer supervisor, so didn't really know what had happened the first time around. And I just told her, I went through this this first time around. And so I'm telling you this right now because I'm not planning on leaving on maternity leave until this date. But I think I also have to mentally prepare myself and prepare you in case I have to go out any earlier than that. Like it could happen. Mm -hmm. And um, my daughter had came at 41 weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like a cruel, oh cruel joke that she played. And I was like, essentially like freaking out that whole time. And especially that last week I was freaking out. Because the other thing was that I was really hoping to try to have a VBAC. And um, the longer she stayed in, and that, you know, everything on Google and WebMD and, you know, all the things you're not supposed to look up, like everything was saying that um, the longer the baby stays in, that the likelihood of having a successful VBAC decreases as the baby gets larger and larger. And so I got to this point where I just felt like I had to take control of the situation. And it was like, okay, well, if she's not born by such and such date, I, I'm going to schedule a C-section. Because at least if I go into a C-section, that's not an emergency. I know that I can heal from it because I've done it before. And, and it won't be an emergency. So it just the, the situation will be different than it was last time. Like I'll go into it knowing that this is what's happening and knowing, you know, what the recovery is like and, and all of that. So, so we did, it was scheduled for September 17th and then around midnight or like, yeah, midnight of September, well, 15th going into 16th. So right before midnight, um, my water broke <laughs> and 
And I have pictures of my tummy, like, you know, instead of being like this, I think she was like this because that's the shape my stomach was. And it was just like, wow. And then my water broke. And being that I had not experienced my water breaking before, I'm like, I think my water just broke. And I remember calling and they're like, yep, that's what happened. They're like, come on down. And um, I'm like, do I have time for a shower? And they're like, yeah, go ahead, take your time. And so <laughs> I took a shower. I called my sister because, um, you know, we needed to have somebody stay with big sister. And um, my sister came over about one in the morning. My daughter woke up and, you know, I had been preparing her for baby sister this whole time. That was the other thing that was different with this pregnancy. I, I found out very early on that it was a girl. I found out at about 10 weeks. And I think the reason I did that was because I had held on to like these hand-me-downs. Um, and I was like, if I'm not going to need them, if, if it's going to be a boy, like, I'm just going to get rid of this because I'm, I'm, I just need to, you know, it's part of like that nesting thing. Like I have to get yeah. rid of what I don't need to make space for what I do need. And yeah. um, so we knew early on it was a girl. And so, um, when my daughter wakes up, I told her me and dad are going to go bring baby sister home. You're going to stay with your auntie. And, um, we get to the hospital, you know, I'm starting to have like closer together and stronger contractions on the way to the hospital. I get to the hospital. I forget how many centimeters they said I was dilated. It wasn't so much. Um, and so I kind of look at them and I'm like, okay, so I have this appointment for, you know, tomorrow for a C-section. Are you going to take me into a C-section right now? Or can we just like have this baby? And they pretty much were like, it's up to you. What do you want to do? And, um, you know, the other thing that was polar opposite was um, in the first pregnancy, I was like, no, no medication, no drugs. And with this one, since I had had the epidural before the C-section and I had felt great when I had the epidural, I was like, yep, give me the drugs. Like, let's yep. just do it. <laughs> that <laughs> was that. me too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so when I got there and they told me, I want to say it was maybe three centimeters. I was like, is it too early for you to give me an epidural? And they were like, no, the way your contractions are coming, we can, we can give it to you right now. I was like, all right, let's do it. Give me the epidural and let's just have this baby. And it was so easy. They gave me an epidural, let's say by like two, three in the morning. They told me to rest. I didn't sleep. I think there was still like this level of anxiety, but I, I did rest. You know, I had my eyes closed. I think I was playing like a meditation app on my phone to try to relax myself. And, um, you know, they came and checked on me at 6 a.m. and I was progressing. And then by like 10 a.m., they're like, all right, we're going to get ready to start pushing. They told me that I pushed for a total of 20 minutes. And there was a time like while I was pushing that they were telling me things. And I don't know if they did this to scare me, but they were like, we might have to use like the vacuum. And if that doesn't work, we might have to go into an emergency C-section. But, you know, then afterwards, they told me it was only 20 minutes. I'm like, how did all of this happen in just 20 minutes? But whatever they said to me, it was just like, OK, I'm going to grab like all the strength and all my might and I'm going to push this baby out of me. And, and she did. She came out and I was so grateful to have had this opposite experience. experience. We came home uh, the next day. So, yeah, she was born on the 16th. We came home on the 17th. And... um 16th. Yeah. And, and I was so grateful that it was this way because, you know, now I have the first baby at home. And, and if I had to stay, you know, with a C-section for the recovery for three or four days away from my first baby, like that would have been, I think the longest I would have had been away from her. Um, I guess even still, like, I don't think I've been away from her for four days. Um, but, but luckily it didn't work out that way. So yeah, I always say, if I knew going into it that I was going to have a birth experience like my second one every time, then I would have all of the babies. But it, it's such an unknown, right? And um, yeah, yeah, I'm definitely done now. <laughs> two is good. And those two experiences are you know, good enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How was the <laughs> how was the recovery from your VBAC? Um, easier, you know. I, I was so surprised at how quickly I could get up and walk. I probably overdid it a little bit. I remember, you know, after you give birth and they have all the different people that come into your room. And I think a social worker came in and was, you know, going to give me resources. And I was like out of the bed, like in my suitcase, like 
I don't know, pulling things out, organizing things. And she she looked at me and she's like, oh, usually moms that are in the bed, like you're up and walking around. And I'm like, yeah, I feel great. And I think I also had like all the happy like endorphins yeah. running through me <laughs> and like the love hormones running through me. So I was just, I felt so great. The next day when I came home, I was like, oh, I feel like I got ran over by a bus because, you know, the drugs were off and all of yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, it was definitely easier in that way. What was difficult, and this, you know, just goes to prove that every child is different, is that I wasn't able to breastfeed my second baby. And so it was tough at first to, I think, even just come to terms with it. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, is your baby eating? Is your baby growing? Like, it doesn't matter how. And I ended up yeah. um, pumping for like the first three months of her life and um, build up the freezer stash. Uh, she got breast milk for the first six months. And, and you know, somewhere in there, we had to like supplement with formula. And then after six months, she was a formula fed baby. And, you know, that's okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I love that is formula. best. <laughs> yeah. Um, would you give any advice to just a new mom that went through birth trauma and how they can kind of, you know, work through that and everything? Yeah, I think just being gentle and kind with yourself. Um, you know, so many of these things are out of our control and, um, you know, I think for me, I, I, replayed it in my head and wondering like could I have done something different was it something I ate you know like all of these things and I'll never know and and so it's like there's really no point in trying to pinpoint exactly why and at the end of the day it's most likely not something that I did I'm just you know I think when when you're in those situations we sometimes just try to understand and rationalize like why did this happen but and so I guess yeah that would be my advice is to try to let go of that piece and and just be be gentle with yourself so that you can be super present in in the moment mm-hmm. um and and you know you also have to like forgive yourself and allow yourself you know to grieve what you thought the experience was going to be um it's okay to cry about it. I cried so much in the early days with with both of them, actually, because I was grieving different things, you know, grieving the birth yeah. experience, grieving the breastfeeding with the second child. Like, it, it's tough. And, um, you know, you're going through this now, Natalie, but like going from one child to two is way more than twice the work. And so, again, take it easy and take all of the help you can get. Like, people are always like, how can they help? How can they help? And I think as moms, sometimes we just want to feel capable. But I think especially in those early days, just take all of the help you can get. (laughs) Take a nap. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, totally agree. Of like, how can I help? And I'm just like, I got it. Like, (laughs) yeah, like for me, it was always like, these are my kids. This is my family. Like, I have to do it. (laughs) But yeah, it's like, "Ah, yes, take help. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. We need a village. (laughs) Yes. Totally. Village. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, I like love what you said about like, there is so much unknown. So, like, how can you really pinpoint anything? But also, I, I, can't you know I can't speak on like your behalf or anything but I feel like almost that part would just like weigh on me too like the unknown like how did this happen why did this happen yeah yeah Yeah. it's tough like I I definitely like you know I tried I thought of so many things um one of my cravings late in my pregnancy was pineapple and I would just go to like buy that like store-bought cut pineapple like this bowl and just eat it to myself and then later on, people are like, oh, you're not supposed to eat that much pineapple that late into your pregnancy. That's definitely what did it. And I'm just like, really? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. But <laughs> I think you have to eat like a pound a day. Like, I don't know. Probably even more than that. That's not even that much. But <laughs> yeah, I never heard this pineapple thing. So I'm confused. Yeah. There's like an <laughs> enzyme in it. 
that oh. reacts or something. I don't know the science I, part, I, but. I mean, maybe I overdid it. Maybe. Who knows? <laughs> I doubt it. We're always so quick to just blame ourselves, though. <laughs> you know. Is there anything else that you wanted to share or any other advice that you would give to new moms? I think that's it. You know, just taking taking help when you need it. Self-care, yeah. you know. I mean, it sounds like generic because everybody says it, but it's so important. You know, doing things for you, just you, having moments that are just yours. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, even for, for you, Natalie, you're such a new mom and I know Liz, you have kids too, like, but you have your podcast. And even if your podcast is talking to women about their birth experience, it's something that you're doing away mm-hmm. from your kids just for yourself. Um, I, and I also have a podcast and I'm like, talk to women and, um, talk to their, about their experiences, not necessarily around birth, but, um, it's something that fills me up and brings me joy that is separate from my kids. And so I think everybody, whatever it is for yourself, you know, making sure you make time for that as a mom. Yeah, I love that. For sure. I want to hear about your podcast, but I wanted to say this first. Um, I heard something t- the other day about um, sometimes there are things that quantity is better than or is superior than quality. Um, and self-care is one of those things like it's better to just like go have an hour of like a really subpar workout (laughs) rather than like only taking 10 minutes like do a really intense workout (laughs) for yourself you know like (laughs) just take the hour even if like you don't even feel like it yeah rather than just taking 10 minutes for yourself (laughs) yeah no we have to like Put it in our calendars, our, our self care or, or our passions, our hobbies, like, you know, really intentionally carve the time out for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who, oh, um, tell us about your podcast a little bit. Yeah. So my podcast is called Fearlessly Divine. Um, pretty much I explore themes of following your intuition, following, you know, those things, what lights you up, your passion, um, and, others like self-love self-care healing um themes uh ultimately to to live your best life my instagram handle is uh omaya g o-h-m-a-y-a-g-e-e um and then yeah through my instagram bio you can find links to the podcast or you can find the podcast on spotify apple google anywhere you listen to your podcast perfect well thank you so much again for coming on tonight and um I would check out your podcast too. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for for making this space to tell my story. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh-huh. great hearing your story. And, and then we'll link um, your Instagram and your podcast on our show notes and that way people can connect with you there. We'll see you next episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>